what are the gains and losses when we think about moving from um, a prince, more of a printed encounter with uh, the Bible um, to a more digitally mediated encounter with the Bible, whether that's through a device or through, um, a, you know, a worship experience? Well, I think some of the gains are um, with a device, you can move your way around a lot more rapidly in the Bible. So you don't have to remember where Hosea sits in the Minor Prophets, for example, to jump to Hosea very quickly. Um, oftentimes when I was even teaching um, Bible classes with students, I would teach them how to use Bible Gateway quickly on an online quiz so that they could actually get through the breadth of the scriptures quickly to engage instead of getting stuck in one place. So, so I think there's a lot of chance for uh, comparison. For example, when I was in college, I used my NIV study Bible. And when I wanted to know what related to a certain passage in Philippians, I needed to flip through on all the passages they recommended. Now I can take a word, someone can take a word, throw it into um, the search bar and find things really quickly. So in terms of cross-referencing, mm -hmm. I think that's really fast. In terms of comparing other um, versions very quickly, I think there's a lot to be gained. For audible kind of listening to the Bible, for centuries, the Bible was meant to be heard. And, and I think that's a benefit too. So, so there's a lot of benefits there. I think the deficits um, can be uh, in terms of the just knowing where you're at in the canon as a whole. Um, being able to um, orient yourself, that if I opened my Bible right in the middle, I didn't hit the New Testament, that there was so much Old Testament still. And something about that physically reminds us as uh, uh, a New Testament people and a Protestants that there's a lot of history uh, before we ever get to the witness of who Jesus Christ is. Mm -hmm. So that physically, I think, is important. In terms of the technology of a of a bound book, it was meant to do two things, wasn't it? I mean, not only have everything in one place, but to say, you know, nothing else is going to be added to this. Mm -hmm. We have four Gospels in a codex because these are the four that are trustworthy. So going digitally does have the capacity to lose all boundary in terms of the scriptures as well, um, to lose that sense that this is what belongs. Uh, it's, so the, the, the access, sort of the enhanced access to the text is, you know, each, each new technology kind of gives you more of that, right? The, you went from the scroll to the codex, the codex provides you kind of a, you can jump into the text much more easily. Well, um, yeah, and it's, and it's, it's versatile, it's transportable. Right. And I think this is what's great about the digital as well. Um, I mean, the, the, early, um, uh, the early generations that were using a codex, the, um, you find among Christians that there was a really robust um, access to mm -hmm. the scriptures because they had this form they could take it around in. Right, right. So um, the same seems true now. I mean, I know people who would never carry a Bible around all day with them, but they can be on the bus and 15 minutes to spare and think, oh, I'll get my readings in, mm -hmm. right? Um, I was just playing around with a new, a couple of new different Bible study type apps that ask you at the beginning, how much time are you going to spend each week, which days of the week, and then they parse it out parse by how many, um, uh, uh, what you should be uh, engaging each day. So I think the capacities, mm -hmm. the portability are really good. Yeah. So one, so so one point you made about you know the the ability to hold the whole canon you know in this kind of right. portable um, artifact, textual artifact, um, that that risks being fragmented when when you move it into um, kind of a digital setting, whether that's on a device or it's online. Um, so that I mean that that's a theological <laughs> um, yeah you know, uh, question. What 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 other theological questions, um, you know, are there as you think about changes in formats? Well, I think the word that you used in terms of fragmented is important, but I think fragmenting is uh, a danger we've had with the scriptures, whether uh, in printed form or digital, uh, for a number of generations now. So, of course, uh, I don't need to tell you the scriptures were put together because there was a community that held these texts as um, essential and as sacred. 
And so there's always a danger as soon as you take the text out of the community that it becomes um, quite fragmented that way. Um, honestly, I think that's the bigger danger with it, whether it is in print form or in digital form, the, um, the, the fragmenting of text away from community. And as a pastor, especially in this COVID time, I'm finding the fragmentation is our biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the other day about, uh, I don't know if you'll relate to this, there was a point when Weight Watchers started using an app, offering an app for things mm -hmm. uh, and went digital versus the in-person meetings. And I think the thing that just, that they never found a replica for is nobody wanted to do their Weight Watchers meeting online. So people who individually were very self-motivated and every once in a while had one of these um, sort of AI coaches that helped them with their weight loss, like Noom uses right now, just that individualized weight loss plan is what digital was versus a communal one is when you got together. Now we're having to do communal digitally. Um, and I think we're hitting all the same problems where um, it's too easy to just sort of Pinterest post your favorite verse with the background that you like in whatever theme you want to put it in. Um, and that fragmenting, that atomizing of the scriptures is, is, is a real challenge. Well, yeah, I appreciate you pointing out that this, that, that, that fragmentation is not a new phenomenon. I mean, you know, when I've, when I've taught, uh, you know, what is a book? You know, I, I, I tend to look at different aspects of, of how a book functions. I mean, there's the, there's the content. So there's what's in the thing itself. And then there's the container right. that sort of mediates access to it. But then that doesn't quite capture everything. There, there's another dimension. And this is where I would kind of use the term community that, that the whole thing is there for, <laughs> you know, that, right. that sort of brings together the author and the audience. And so that, the, the role of community, then, you know, as long as that's in place, then the form itself, you know, matters because, you know, different forms have different affordances, but, but if the community is in place, you know, the, the community in which the text is read and interpreted, yeah. then the container becomes a little less important. Right. Yeah. No, I think it probably does just in terms of the technological medium that we use to get these words out. Um, um, a phrase that folks will hear me use a lot at church is, you know, scripture requires a dance partner. Yeah, and so it's going to seek a dance partner, whether or not um, a person thinks it will. So it's either with an, a person's own individual story or with a broader story or a broader community. So any idea that scripture is going to speak all by itself without some sort of dialogical partner is just silly anyway. Um, but I do think we don't like to talk about authority very much. And mm -hmm. part of the shame is we've talked about authority in relationship to scripture these days, um, particularly evangelical circles with a kind of content authority um, that here's, here's what the text says in its baldest sense. And therefore there's authority there, but there's another sense of authority that these, this collection of writings has authority um, and there's disagreement within co the collection even. And so we even authorize those tensions within this collection. And there is something about the technology of a scroll or a codex or something that holds it that we lose with digital. Um, and, and I think there's something related to that, yeah. that you can, um, it's always been human nature like Thomas Jefferson wasn't what wasn't it who cut out and made his own it's a fascinating right, right, artifact yeah. to see <laughs> in the Smithsonian but we can do that so readily now with digital um, and yeah. we can do it without um, I mean the artifact in the Smithsonian where you can see the Bible that Jefferson cut uh, did his cutting from in order to create his new version right mm -hmm. uh, you can do that digitally and you just lose the first version um, so there's something there is something about, even within scripture, um, in Deuteronomy, it refers to this book. In Jeremiah, it refers to uh, make a book of this. Je Revelation refers to the scroll. So it's not just the writings. Even inside the scripture, there's an authority once it's captured in this medium. And how do we still communicate and submit that authority when it's digital and so easy to manipulate? I mean, it does make me wonder if, if there is some, if, if there's a possibility of you, ben, you somehow leveraging what you can do with a digital um, object 
to, to actually reinforce, um, huh. you know, some of the things that say the print, you know, uh, codex was, a, the print or manuscript codex was able to reinforce. Right. For, for example, you talk about sort of tensions in, in the canon itself. Um, and, and I'm not a designer of, of such things, but if you could imagine a way where the technology could actually surface the tension. So you are, let's say you're reading a text, but then there's, there's like, oh, if, <laughs> it's sort of like a recommendation engine, right? It's like, oh, if you're interested in this, you might be interested in this. Or here's, yeah. you know, because we, we do this with like the, you know, see also, um, yes. you know, sort of marks. But it, it, digitally, th there would be a lot more opportunity for, um, you know, sort of bringing the, the intertextual nature of the, highlighting the intertextual nature of the text. Yeah, I think that, I think that'd be really interesting. I mean, I'm a huge fan, especially being a New Testament scholar of the digital because I can, I can whip around and work with things inside that text so right, much right. more quickly, right? Yeah. So um, uh, I don't have a lot of, as much as I, I will always grab a print book um, over Kindle if I really want to work with something, but it's because I'm an artifact. I'm a dinosaur. I mean, I'm, this is just what I grew up with, right? I still longhand things. It's a challenge for me to ask myself, okay, is it just because there's a certain medium I'm used to? Mm -hmm. Or is there something that could genuinely be lost in translation here that if we don't want it lost, we have to learn how to translate it rather than just saying, well, this is going to be better because it, it can only happen this way. What, what about the, the going back to the, the notion of the kind of community engagement with, yeah. with the biblical text. So as, as, as you're doing worship um, online at the moment, um, or in the future when you maybe have more, um, you know, ways of digitally mediating things, you know, in a, in a kind of face-to-face -face environment, um, you know, how, how do you think about that um, theologically in terms of how you introduce, how you present, um, how people interact with the text? So let me make sure I know what you're asking uh, me. So when we're doing worship online, for example, and we're interacting with the text in that community, mm -hmm. um, what practices or habits do we have over a digital medium that communicate the, um, the special nature of scripture or, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, that's it. Yeah. I have been thinking about this a lot lately because right now what we'll tend to do is have someone who reads the text same way as you would in person. And sometimes we get real fancy and put the words up as well. In person, when we're worshiping in person, I don't actually like putting the words on the screen when someone's reading because I prefer people to have the read experience of the text. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some simple things like doing a call and response with texts that invite that. Um, as a preacher, I'll frequently say to people, okay, pull out your device and leave it open. Pull out your Bible and leave it open. Look at this, what word do you see? Um, if you're using a device, switch, switch uh, uh, versions. What does another version say? Look it up yourself. Um, you know what I'd really like to start playing with is what we can do with illustrated text. Um, what we can do digitally is we can show pictures. I'm not, I'm not talking like the sort of sappy sort of pictures, but, <laughs> but places where people have, have really sought and, and tried to um, uh, give a, a visual, almost, uh, almost an icon iconographic mm -hmm. um, illustrated version or response to text and let that be sitting there visually mm -hmm. while we're reading. I think there are ways that we can use silence and image and even music and 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 an image around text digitally that we can't do as effectively in person because um, on an online worship service if the whole screen is taken up with um, something that is visually engaging the text that's different than having a tiny screen up as in part of a massive sanctuary worship service so we almost have to learn how to make um, uh, the physical presence that we're hearing scripture in use the screen at, in a sanctuary kind of sense that holds then the, the text, if that makes sense. You know, the other thing I think we sometimes lose digitally, I'll notice this when I am reading um, on a page 
there's a certain amount of resistance and educators talk about this, how having some friction in the system, Mm -hmm. having some resistance in the system really makes you learn. Mm -hmm. Whereas sometimes a a flat screen or a, or, or a digital medium removes some of the friction from the system. So that's something about how do we reintroduce Mm -hmm. friction in the system? You know, as an educator, when we're, uh, when people are just typing things into their computers to take notes when I'm teaching, I know that's different than if they have to work something out on paper because there's already friction in the system that way. Right, right. Um, so this is an open question for me, Michael. I don't have an answer on this one. But the, when I talk about maybe there's some aspects of print medium that um, are really valuable and we have to figure out how we're going to translate them digitally, I wonder uh, the friction in the system, the, the, the tension. Uh, well, it's not tension. It's just, it's that friction that makes you slow yeah. down with it, which isn't present digitally. And there is yeah. something to be gained, I think, by having yeah. it. Um, and I don't know how we would honor that and, learn, and, and communicate it or recreate it in a digital medium. Yeah, that's, that's really, that's really important. You know, the frictionless, you know, is, is often a critique of technology, um, right? Digital technologies in particular. Um, It's talked about in terms of privacy a lot. Interesting. um, And how easy it is to just sort of like, you know, click and move on. And, you know, yes, I'm right. Is, you know, (laughs) translating that into kind of a, a worship context. Um, or even just a sort of personal spiritual, uh, uh, you know, discipline uh, context is, is, is a really interesting insight. Well, yeah. And I even think about, I have colleagues in um, New Testament studies who are amazing at remembering where certain words in the original language, for example, yeah. Yeah. were used in other places. And their knowledge of that, the fact that that knowledge is embedded, that they can't just pull it up yeah. very rapidly on the computer the way I often do when I'm doing my searches and I'm doing my work, there's, there are connections they make mm-hmm. because they've been forced to yeah. learn and embed that knowledge themselves and not rely on the digital that are, um, that are unique. They're unique to having to have learned it, I guess, um, and memorized it. Where, and, yeah. and so so maybe that's one way we reintroduce it is just take the time to have people memorizing things. But yeah. uh, but there is something about it, I think. Uh, do you remember, did you ever grow up in a church tradition that did sword drills? Oh, yes. <laughs> See, I didn't. This is a new thing for me as a Lutheran oh, yeah. kid. The Lutherans yeah, don't do sword really. drills. <laughs> but, um, but we were expected to memorize yeah. scripture and know things, right? But there's something about just having to learn and know Okay, where did I hear that before? Where was this said before? Where does this theme show up a lot? Um, I, I will I will say that you know when when I was in seminary, it was very easy to tell how people have been raised in the church if, if they had been totally. raised in a memorize the Bible, sword drill, more conservative. They they were like. <laughs> Were, yeah, it was admirable. They, they were, actually, they, they had a, they had a special secret skill set that, that yeah. others did not because they're like, I don't know where Jose is. <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, no, I don't I really I even name all the books in the Bible. Yeah, yeah. And um, sometimes I'll be having a conversation with someone, and they'll say, "Well, what do you do with the fact that you know um, in Corinthians Paul says this, whereas, and they can come up with that." Yeah, yeah. which. Um, um, and again, I think we can uh, account for that and work with that and, and, and have disciplines outside of the digital yeah. medium that create that. But there has to be some intentionality. I think that the, the trick there is, is identifying what, what the, the, you know, where, we, where you kind of started, what gets lost. And so right. how do you preserve those things in parallel with the digital? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was personally glad that when I started studying Greek, that I didn't, I wasn't using Bible software. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I was, I was looking stuff up. I was, yeah. you know, I was, and, and I had to work harder, but, but, you know, something came of that. Whereas when I went on to, to study Hebrew, I, I went to the Bible software and it, it just, I didn't learn it as well. Um, I mean, that could be explained in different languages, but, but there was some, there was a different way of learning with Bible software (laughs) than without it. It was just a lot more work. No, it's true. It really is. I was reading, um, uh, earlier today, I was, uh, 
uh, I came across again an Anne Lamott story she tells. It's this Hasidic story where um, uh, a rabbi was speaking with students to say how we, we memorize and work with the scriptures so that they can be laid on our hearts. And one of the students said, well, why do you say laid on our hearts and not in our hearts? And the rabbi's response was, because the only one that can take it in your heart is um, God. And the way that happens is when your heart breaks open, the scripture will fall in, mm. which I thought that was just a beautiful concept. When your heart breaks open, the scripture will fall in. And so that sense of having enough internalized scripture that when life experiences happen, that break something new about the scripture to fall in is really important. And we need to come up with the type of friction that internalizes uh, the scriptures. I was really thinking yeah. about this after you emailed me because yeah. um, it made me go back and look again at my history on the codex, honestly. Uh-huh. When did we move from uh-huh. scroll to, to codex kind of thing? Because I'm much more interested in that if I'm direct yeah. than I'm yeah. interested in the printing press type thing. Yeah. Um, because that's always fascinated me that in the ancient world, um, how robust the commitment was to the printed uh, word among Christians in ways to the written word, to the codex in ways that just wasn't there in other places. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think it's really interesting. It, you know, it, it was one of those things that I, I kind of stumbled upon later in seminary. Um, you know, we, we, cause you know, we did a lot of, you know, kind of literary, it was really more literary criticism, I think was kind of the, the vogue, uh, you know, when I was studying the Bible. Um, right. I mean, you know, I had a, I had a good professor in New Testament who's very much a historian, <laughs> uh, right. you know, so that, that was a nice grounding, but, but I, I became interested in uh, just sort of how materially, how, how this stuff all yeah. happened. <laughs> yeah. And that, that's actually one of the reasons I ended up kind of like becoming a librarian because you totally. know, I started going into special collections and looking at the, you know, the scroll fragments and the codex fragments and then the early you know, the early manuscript and printed books and just the material culture that was just so fascinating. And, you know, people, you know, they look at their, their, you know, study Bible, you know, without really realizing all that went into making that, you know, it's true, isn't it? Yeah. And so, and, and again, you know, how we read a book, um, you know, we, we, this is actually one of the limitations of the, of the print format is, is that you, you pick this book up and you think it's like one book, one voice, you know, and it all just sort of like, you know, flows in this narrative. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, and th- there's a narrative there, but you, you know, you've got multiple voices, you've got, um, yeah, you know, tensions, you know, you have um, different types of books, of course, you know, you, you know, all this. So it, it yeah. just, you know, the, the printing press does tend to, and I shouldn't say the printing press, but print culture, which, which really you don't get until, you know, like the broader literacy, like in the 18th century right. on, when you have more affordable books, more people can read. Yeah. And then at that point, you know, then you have the book that most people right. have today, which actually is probably only a couple hundred years old as an artifact. You know, a nice mm-hmm. clean, all together, right. exactly. printed, you know, uniform thing. It looks the same. Exactly. Um, you know, so so what we're what we're comfortable with, most Protestants and, and Catholics to a certain extent too, is, is actually not that old of no. an artifact. Yeah. No, it's <laughs> true. Presentation of the Bible. And so uh, Yeah, it's true. Because it, I find it really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Like what gets lost when you move from a scroll where you mm-hmm. can move back and forth very quickly, yeah. right? And you see where this particular text is in the whole that way yeah. versus yeah. a codex that is a quick flip right. of the page and you can lose your yeah. place. And then you go to digital and it's, a, it's even smaller. It's even yeah. more of a fragment. So yeah. that question of how do we keep, keep these particular verses in the sense mm-hmm. of the whole and having people know the whole and how it goes, I think that's pretty, yeah. pretty important. It is, but I, but I think your point about community is, is sort of the key there. Well, thank you for your time. Well, I appreciate you reaching out, Michael. It's, it's, yeah. it's always a, an honor to have a chance to do some interacting, so thank you. Yeah.